Episode yeah, yeah. 17, The Guadalupe Complex. You know, this episode, you know, truly does hit close to the heart for me because we were raised Catholics, you know, and that's just not something that you necessarily just give up. Even if you decide to walk away from the truth like I did, uh, you, you could never truly walk away from it because of your environment. Richard Dawkins... I believe is his name. He's probably one of the most famous skeptics. And even him who is, or sorry, atheist. He's one of the most famous atheists. And mm-hmm. even he who thinks that he is an atheist says that he's a cultural Christian. You know, you have your Christmas carols that he loves, you know, these holidays that revolve around Christianity. And even he says that he, you know, that he truly can't walk away from what it is, even if it is a cultural Christianism or, or whatever you want to call it. But, you yeah, know, I, 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 uh, it's because he doesn't, you, you know, when you don't, us humans, I feel like are, we're meant to be tribal and meant to belong to things. Mm. And when you're an atheist, I feel like you don't belong to anything or, I mean, what do you, I mean, the science and, you know, but even then just, I've always believed science goes so far then comes God. And to that, I, I don't know, I just feel some type of peace whenever, you know, like I said, we're not, I'm not a very, you know, I haven't devoted 100% to Jesus how he wants me to, but I'm working on my way there. And I just find a peace uh, speaking and understanding, you know, like reading the Bible or, or just having some sort of faith. And I can under, I can live the way maybe some atheists live without having to, I don't know, uh, stand for something or yeah. belong to anything, you know, just not knowing that we're, you know, yeah. I feel like at the end, I feel like, and this might be arrogant for me to say or ignorant or whatever. And, uh, I feel like whenever I really truly do believe like when you're on your deathbed and you're about to die and let's just say you're an atheist or whatever, that's when it, that's when you're going to like forgive me lord this and mm-hmm. that you know i literally this and yeah i feel like there's no way people just go out with the ego because your ego is gone is gone oh, you know yeah. when you're at your most vulnerable yeah. when you're about to be out the door how can you have that so you, you know, know death teaches you humility i think and that's when you have a lot of these crazy stories like near-death experiences that people that aren't religious maybe some people that are atheist there's actually a really good movie that came out. I think it's on Amazon too. I can't remember what it's called, but it's just about near death experiences mm-hmm. and how they convert or how it connects them to Christianity in particular. Yep. And, and you know that, that atheistic mentality, it truly doesn't stand for anything. What does it stand for? You know, all it does is, you know, it, cause atheism comes with skepticism and, those things just deny everything and it not just religion but you know all these other you know supernatural stories ufo stories if you will you know they think of it you know if there's no science or if it can't be explained it's just that we don't have an explanation for it now but we will in the future what kind of a mindset is that yeah you know Mm -hmm. and and what do you stand for you know I, i would argue that Society is what it is today because of Christianity. We have our morals because of Christianity. And it's, although there is parallels to other religions, I think that Christianity stands above everything else, you know? And can you, can you truly make that argument for atheism that, no, it's just the way human beings evolve? Mm-hmm. Well, look at society now we have a godless society and it's decaying are you really going to make that argument for our decayed society which is undeniable here in the west and i think that you cannot which is crazy it's crazy that you say that because in a way i mean i'm not saying in a way i think you are right to say that uh i guess you know like we have some type of morals because of Christianity, Mm -hmm. because if not, it would be like in the old times where kind of like, I don't know, 
kind of the old times where you oh that that guy just fucking cussed you off you just kill him Mm -hmm. and you don't have that but also i don't know because you know the wild wild west you know the uh the mayans and you know the the aztecs mesoamerica you know that, that was kind of which they had their own type of god but that is uh i don't know yeah but you look at these you look at these just look at every nomadic or every you know ancient tribal group and you look at native americans you look at the aztecs the mines what was what was their life before they got conquered it was worse it was worse than you know when la conquista happened in mexico do you really think although it was a very bloody period and we have that and we have those records because we recorded them or sorry the spanish recorded them whoever were the conquerors recorded their side of the history but do you really think that before that there wasn't the same killing if not more going on the aztec tribes would always fight the as as we said the puripechans or vice versa the chichimecas the mayans before then and what would they do they would do human sacrifices they would do ritual they would they would capture they would capture their opponents imprison them and then offer them to their gods as blood sacrifices and what did the conquering give us it gave it although it was bloody and people you can be a snowflake all you want about it oh that's bad that's bad but it give it gave us the world we are today because i I, i'll bet you anything you want that if we go back to those times i'm pretty sure people won't want to get in prison people wouldn't want to get their hearts ripped out of their chest while they're still living they wouldn't want to get filleted alive skinned (laughs) alive they wouldn't want to get boiled alive yeah, but that's the, the and that and we go back to the same thing where it's just we take the shit for granted. And, oh yes, uh, yes, we think that supermarkets always existed, and we got we I yeah. can just go buy food, and oh fuck, I'm you know I'm uh, everything's so easy right now, you know that we don't have to worry about it. Plus, we live in America, so we don't have to deal mm-hmm. with stuff that happens in the Middle East or or South America and stuff like that. So we take it for granted, and maybe that's the beauty of it that we take it for granted that that. Yeah, you know, that happened. that we can that we can think those things. Now, it's not to say that Christianity is innocent because you look at the things in the Old Testament and those were grotesques, you know. You have truly the same examples as you find in other religions like Judaism and Islam and all these things. But the thing about Christianity is that it got its 2.0. It got its remastering. Uh, not necessarily that it was to, you know, just to remaster, that was to just convert or control people because Jesus was a historical figure and he's the most documented historical figure of all time. So you have that historical truth to it. And you find that in Christianity, Jesus corrects the old laws and implements a new law, which is a much more peaceful one. You know, Islam is a conquering religion it's such a powerful religion and you can see it now of you know how it converts these young people because they they associate themselves to it they they defend islam defends its own opposed to christianity but you know christianity was jesus taught jesus converted the majority of the world through love yeah through love and again it's not to say that they're innocent because you know you have the crusades which people talk a lot of shit about but ultimately the crusades were a good thing uh, they often forget that the Crusades were launched against Muslim oppressions. Muslims were conquering the European world and they were oppressing them. The Spanish got conquered by the Muslim world for, and they were conquered for, I think, a Muslim presence in Spain was probably around 800 years. People forget that. That's why the Crusades were launched to launch a war against, you know, to protect themselves, essentially. Well, it's because if. Uh, you know, I don't know, like, Christianity is the only religion that portrays peace. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a cheek for a cheek and I, you know, or, you know, you turn the, you basically yeah, you turn the other turn it, cheek. Yeah. And there's no other religion out there that you can just talk shit about and not get, I don't know, killed or whatever, mm-hmm. you know. So, I think... 
And, and I do find it funny that everybody does uh, mock, you know, oh, Jesus, yeah. uh -huh. you know, it, it's one thing that most religions have some sort of interpretation about Jesus. And they all, all, you know, and essentially all the major religions do lead to Jesus in a way. They all mention him. They all acknowledge him, but they don't acknowledge, you know, the other ones, you know. It's in, they, they live in that denial, but yeah. the understanding that they need it. I mean, Islam, you, Jesus comes back and. <laughs> yeah, he, he's born of a virgin. So these what? Things. You know, so yeah. you don't, uh, it's just confusing. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Confusing. Now, our purpose here isn't to offend anyone with historical truths and facts. You know, at the end of the day, we just want to do one thing. Intellects is about one thing, and that's to challenge, to challenge the thought, to challenge what evidence is out there, and to just, you know, thought-provoking conversations ultimately is what it is. Now, correct. with that being said, let's go ahead and dive into our intro, Intellects Episode 17, The Guadalupe Complex. Today, we dive into the intricate tapestry of our history and beliefs that shape our world. Today, we explore a symbol deeply woven into the cultural and spiritual fabric of Mexico, La Virgen de Guadalupe, revered as a mother, protector, and an emblem of Mexican identity. This figure's origins and the layers of her story reveal a complex interplay of indigenous beliefs and Catholicism, we will attempt to unravel the complicated truths behind the Virgin of Guadalupe, examining her impact on society, religion, and national identity. We will try to uncover the mysteries of the faith and history that surround this iconic image. You know, I want to start this off with you. I guess we already started it off, but I would like to ask you a question. You just got back from Mexico and in a way made your pilgrimage to La Virgen de Guadalupe. I did. What I was did. what was that about? You want to kind of... Yeah, uh, so we went to, obviously we went to Mexico, what, three weeks ago? Two, mm -hmm. three weeks ago. Um, and we actually had this intention of putting out this podcast kind of sooner or whatever, but, you know, it, it's so, it's so massive. Yeah, it's... And... Um, it was so it was kind of we got there we arrived in you know we're from Michoacan and we arrived there and we actually went to all the 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 Puripecha sites mm -hmm. around there and then we decided to go to Mexico and we left on a evening on let's just say Thursdays to get to spend the whole Friday there and yeah like all that time you know you kind of have a it's kind of sketchy going through Mexico and but we were in the in the highways in the in the autopistas. autopistas and all along i felt safe though because in a way i knew that i was doing that pilgrimage because you know because mm -hmm. i asked you i was like is this am i technically doing a pilgrimage and you were like yeah i mean you basically are but once you arrive there there's no doubt there's energy no doubt mm. and i felt it i i feel like i was mad at myself because I had this ego where like I were this ego of denial of feeling it. you feel me uh, where I was like, you know what? Let me go in here with a broad, uh, with a broad, with a clean mind, with a, a clean, clean mind. mind, a clear mind. And let me just not to, you know, let me not get dragged into it by how I was raised. Cause as you know, I was a Virgen de Guadalupe kid. I had Virgen de Guadalupe yeah. jeans and shirts <laughs> and I, you know, everything. Uh, I still have, you know, little, you know, little, iconography yeah, of her. And I was trying to go and and actually a quick story. Uh, my mom was just, you know, telling me this the whole way there. Uh, I guess when I arrived there, the first time I visited um, La Basilica de Guadalupe, that's what it's called. Uh, I guess I got there and people, when you get there, they knee from the entrance to where she is or to where mm -hmm. you can. And I guess I did that when I was what five, six. Yeah, when you when I didn't when I haven't spawned yet, you know, yeah. I didn't know what was live. So that's one thing that I don't understand. I don't remember doing it. I told him I was like, I don't know. She's like, Yeah, it's just like if you. So I don't know. That's a that's kind of a mystery too in that sense. But uh, without taking all that in mind, I just 
kind of went there clear minded and no, there was, I felt energy. I felt energy that I was undeniable. And I was like, I was kind of mad at myself where I was like, dude, why are you kind of bringing your ego to this and not accepting it? Just mm -hmm. accept that energy. And yeah. And, f you know, uh, ultimately I, I, you know, I, I felt it a hundred percent. I'm yeah. not, and this is just me without mm -hmm. having some t sort of bias. Yeah. I also made, um, uh, progress myself when I was uh, younger. I can't remember. Well, I was probably around what seven. It was quite quite a bit. About six years ago, I made a pilgrimage. This was during my own mental battles when I was questioning, you know, religion as as an identity. And I can attest to that same energy. I felt it as well. Um. I've always had pain in, in my knees because of wrestling and of all these other stuff. And I entered her basilica and all my pain went away. And it's the same story we in, in our, in where my, where our parents are from in Mexico, there is, um, uh, we have a beautiful church, you know, El Señor de la Salud, it's Jesus, but we call him, um, the miracle man, if yeah. you will. Uh, and I felt the same thing. I, I, I drove from the Iowa. Health man. The yeah. health man. I guess. I, yeah, I drove. I drove from Iowa nonstop to um, where we're from in Michoacan, which was with brakes and all this stuff. It was like thirty hours nonstop. Mm -hmm. We only stopped for gas and food. My back was aching. My knees were aching, and it was the same experience. I we we always stop by and to to give him thanks for our safe journey, and all my pain goes away. And it's this energy that is inexplicable that science doesn't tell you what it is. You know, you you can't, first of all, you can't even measure these things. This energy, you cannot measure it. And it's things that even now, as uh, you know, I, 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 like I said, I walked away from religion. Even now, this faith that still attracts me towards it, I don't know what it is. You know, could it be that this is what I was raised, that I was just brainwashed? Could very well be, but that resides in the mind. But what about what I feel mm -hmm. in my heart? What it's attracted to me, you know, that little voice that tells me to, you know, come here, you know, in a way. So I can attest to that energy and I don't know what it is, but I know that it's not able to be measured. And in fact, that basilica where you went to is the most visited Christian site in the world. If I'm not mistaken, just in December, when the most pilgrims go there uh more people visit that site or very close to just in the month of december than people visit um the what the mecca the than, mecca yeah then people in visit mecca. yeah really? so, yeah because i because I, 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 I was thinking that uh that the mecca is the most pilgrimage kind of overall. no 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 uh the basilica around 20 million people visit that each year hmm. just in the month of december right around 10 13 million just in the month of december the most in its top three most visited religious site in general you know i i, I think one of the top one or two one is in japan or china and then the other one is in india which is one or two i can't remember what's uh, what's the japan one what kind of religion is that, is that? Catholicism or no? Because mm. I know there isn't there a big Catholic or is that in China? Back a big Catholic following, I know in Asia. Oh, oh in yeah, in Japan. Know, is it Japan yeah, or yeah Asia? Uh, there is rumors or historical evidence that Jesus visited Japan during his missing years because he, he disappears from the Bible like around twelve or something along those lines, and then reappears. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, at, I like at age 30 or something like that. I can't, I'm probably mistaken on that, but it said that he visited India, Japan and other stuff, which again, I go back to that. All these religions mention Jesus. Jesus even shows up in Greek mythology hmm. and yeah, like liberating Hades or something along those lines. They all mention Jesus, but you know, there's, there's definitely something to it. Yeah, there is. Cause it might be uh, like, what is that called when you just uh, kind of just make up stories because of it? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, because in Ethiopia, Ethiopia, uh, you know, Jesus is there. Yeah, way before I think Europe. I think. 
Yeah, well, e- Christianity was in Ethiopia yeah. far more than it, when it was in Europe. I think the Armenians were the first ones to to convert to Christianity very soon after after his death. But so yeah, there's definitely something about this energy now. Which uh, does, which by the way, when you when you visit it, <clears throat> when I went, it wasn't that packed i mean there's still people walking everywhere but then you understand why it's so huge and massive because i was overhearing uh people just walk by saying that yeah good thing you didn't come december because it would have been packed Mm. because what is it december 12th or 15th uh 15 if i'm not mistaken that's when you know we'll get to it but yeah that's when the apparition started uh you're right december 12th Oh, okay. Is when it started to happen. All this stuff started to happen. But yeah, it's all it's crazy things. You know, it's for certainty you cannot deny the story. However, the story is far more complicated than you know, your average Catholic knows. When I was brought up as a Catholic, I would ask these questions, you know, where does the virgin come from? Is you know, who is she? What is this? You know. And often I'd never had a complete story of where she comes from, of what it means of, you know, the Virgin of Guadalupe, is she the Virgin Mary? What it is. So this is definitely a part one of the Guadalupe complex. The the These Marian apparitions cannot, you know, there is, there is full uh, people that dedicate themselves just to Marian apparitions. Hmm. Now, the Guadalupe, Our Lady Guadalupe is part of Marian apparitions. So, yes, Our Lady Guadalupe is the Virgin Mary, is the mother of Jesus Christ. And this isn't the only time that she appeared. She's appeared to multiple different people across the span of our history. And she actually appeared here in the United States as well, in Wisconsin, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, in Wisconsin, she's called Our Lady of Good Help or Our Lady of Champion in 1859. She was granted local devotional approval by the Vatican as well. So oh, she, shit. Yeah, and when I was a young buck, I actually did make a retreat when I was a young kid, but I, I didn't know what it was. Mm. Yeah, I made a retreat. Be- our church went there. I didn't know what it was. You're like, oh, yeah, the Virgin Mary appeared here. and it's. But I do remember something just an energy about that place as well. And so, yes, what is a Marian apparition? Um, It's simply a point in time where the Virgin Mary, the mother mother of Jesus, appears to someone in a ghostly or supernatural fashion. And she often has a message or revelation to tell us. And the Catholic Church does have requirements regarding a true interaction um, and does extensive research or investigations on whether that was the Virgin Mary appearing or not. Hmm. And the Vatican, if you go on Vatican.com, they also have the exact parameters as to what is an authentic apparition. Um, because, as you know, the devil sometimes appears in different ways to try to deceive people and... According to the Vatican's parameter, you have you have to have proof that she visited you. There has to be some sort of a miracle involved, and it has to be in good intentions with the current teachings that we have with the Bible, with Jesus, and all these things. It can't be anything negative, um, which I think that's you know it's kind fr- of obvious. <clears throat> yeah, kind of obvious. Now, so it's not it's not biased then, because you know if you were to say. Oh, hey, you know, the Vatican approved it. I mean, no, th- it, there it could be biased, you know, could be, could be. But what I find interesting is that, for example, in Our Lady of Champion in Wisconsin, she asks questions and there's witnesses and there's miracles performed as well. Now, I don't want to get too far off into all these other Marian apparitions because I do want to kind of focus on Our Lady Guadalupe, but 
Uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that, that we do have our own Marion apparition here in the United okay. States. I was going to ask, keep asking, but I was yeah. like, you know, what did you mean by that? But I think uh, you should start, you should uh, say, give the story. Give the story yeah. about, you know, it's about... Yeah, I, the Guadalupe and it, what happened. So. Yeah, I, I will. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell you the story of La Virgen de Guadalupe, but first there is another story that I would like to tell you that that is the full story of our Virgen of Guadalupe in Mexico at her basilica. So, according to tradition, the Apostle James first encountered Our Lady in Zaragoza, Spain, which, if you didn't know, uh, Zaragoza gets its name by Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus was the Roman emperor at the time, and it, over time it morphed into Saragossa. Saragossa. Huh. In, the year, in the year 40. Now, she was... The Bible never mentions what happens to Mary, but at this time, she was still alive at the, in, you know, in 40 AD. Now, tradition tells us that seven years after the death of Jesus on January 2nd, 40 AD, the Apostle St. James, the elder brother of John, sat tired and disappointed by the bank of Ebro River in what is now Saragossa, Spain. The people of the Roman province of Hispania were not open and receptive to the good news of Jesus and St. James, and he was ready to give up on his efforts to evangelize them. On that January day, the Blessed Virgin Mary, still living in Palestine, appeared to James atop a column or pillar of a stone. With encouraging words, she assured him that the people of Hispania would become Christians and that their faith would be as strong and as durable as the pillar on which she stood. To remember the visit and promise of the Virgin Mary, the first Marian shrine was built around the pillar and James began to convert the pagans of early Spain or Hispania. This was uh, according to the University of Dayton, which is a Catholic university. The full story, again, according to tradition, says that two angels took Mary and appeared and put her atop of that pillar. Now, there is something saying that that pillar, which is, which you can still visit this, this shrine, supposedly it doesn't have no bottom, or whenever they scanned it, it shows that the pillar just keeps there is no foundation to that pillar hmm. uh, again this is a complex this is just a part one of the Guadalupe complexes of the entire interplay of these stories so i don't want to dive into all these different things because we can go forever and ever just on the basilica of guadalupe which is why you you know say it's complex yeah so um but you know that would be a note for another side I think if you try to excavate it, I think our answers would be different. You know, I don't know who came up with that research, but that is when the first Marian apparition started. So I just want to have that foundation as to when the first one started. And now okay. followed to the connection between La Virgen de Guadalupe and Mexico. And, you know, we, we find that her story truly begins in Spain as her first Marian apparition started. So, the world in Spain in the round around the year 700, the Muslims defeated the Visigoths who were currently governing Hispania. The Visigoths were the last straw that actually uh, de uh, defeated the Roman Empire, if you did not know. And this launched a Muslim occupation in modern day Spain that would last roughly 800 years. And as you know, throughout history, Christians have been the most persecuted group of all time. Mm -hmm. And during this Muslim occupation by the natural law of warfare and the, the native ethnic groups were persecuted and for their faith and nationality. You know, these were bloody times for the Spanish natives, if you will. And during this time in the 700s, over in Extremadura, Spain, there was a group of retreating Christians fighting off the Muslims. They had with them a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary and baby Jesus. This statue was given to St. Leander Bishop of Seville by the Pope St. Gregory the Great and was believed to have been carved by St. Luke the Evangelist, one of, of Jesus' apostles. Faced with the threat of annihilation, 
The fleeing Christians wanted to secure the statue, so they placed it in an iron casket and buried it somewhere in the cave of the province of Extremadura. Those who carried the image to safety died in battle, and the statue's whereabouts were forgotten and lost to time. Fast forward to the 1300s, Spain was on a campaign to, re to reconquer Spain from Muslim rule. At this time, they were an established power. However, they were not fully free from Muslim occupation. This time period is known as La Reconquista, the reconquering of Spain. And an incredible event occurred. This event would be known as the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Extremadura, Spain. Hmm. According to tradition, the version of Guadalupe from Spain refers to an entirely different story, origin story connected to the image and the title of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is also deeply rooted in Catholic tradition, but separate to La Virgen de Guadalupe in, in Mexico. Mexico yeah. the, the Spanish story dates back to the 14th century in Extremadura, where the Virgin Mary is said to have appeared to a shepherd named Gil Cordero. According to the legend, La Virgen led him to the buried statue near the Guadalupe River. The statue was believed to have been carved by St. Luke the Evangelist. It's the same story that I just told you. Mm -hmm. And hidden centuries earlier, earlier during the Moorish invasion. After the discovery, a shrine was built on the site, which later evolved into a monastery of Santa Maria of Guadalupe. This site became a major pilgrimage destination in medieval Spain. The Virgin of Guadalupe was declared as the patroness of Extremadura and eventually honored as the patroness of all Hispanic territories by the Spanish crown. The Virgin of Guadalupe is revered as her protective rule over the Spanish realms and her shrine con continues to be an important religious site in Spain distinct from the Mexican native but sharing the same deep Marian devotion. I do have a picture of who this statue was. This is the statue that was, again, put in an iron casket. And this is the monastery in which she resides. It was, this monastery was first a small shrine, but again, it evolved into this monastery. This is supposedly believed to have been carved by St. Luke, one of Jesus' apostles, and currently still resides there. Now, she is often referred to as La Victoriosa because after her image was found in Spain, um, La Reconquista was finally complete and the victory was attributed to the Virgin Mary. Some interesting notes about the monastery that was built for the Virgin Mary was that it was built by Masons, by Muslim Masons. They were, they converted to, Muslims converted from, to Christianity, yeah. <clears throat> and the Guadalupe name derived from a mix between Moorish, which is Muslim, and Latin languages. Wadi, meaning valley, Muslim word, and lupus meaning wolves. The location was to believe to be infested by wolves when the Muslims invaded. Hmm. The version, it's also <laughs> often referred to as um, by Valley of the Wolves as well, something along those lines. Um, but the Virgin Mary got her name by the place she was ultimately found where the shrine was built of, you know, along the Guadalupe River. Another interesting note is that Christopher Columbus, if you know who that is, also visited her before launching his expedition to the New World and to the Americas. Another interesting person that visited this place was Cortez, Cortez. if you know this guy. He also visited her before conquering the Mexica lands. And a Franciscan friar, Sumagarra, also prayed there before heading off to Mexico. If you don't know who Samagarra is, he is the bishop who Juan Diego went to After. tell about this these things. Now, so this is what you have going on in Spain. And at this time, you know, around the, you know, late 1400s, they launched the expedition to Mexico. 
Now, the world in Mexica land, before the Spanish conquered the native empires of Mesoamerica, were constantly at war. You know, we talked about this earlier in, in our episode. And they all contribute to the cycle of conquering and using the vanquished as human sacrifices. Now, during the Spanish conquest in the 1500s and even after there was a tremendous amount of loss of life due to illnesses carried over by the Spanish and just the natural law of warfare. So again, we have a time in our world, in particularly in Mexico, where there's so much loss of life. And what happens? She appears. La Virgen de Guadalupe. Um, the Virgin Mary appears again. And this is where we have our story of La Virgen de Guadalupe that it, mostly you know, Mexican Catholics know of, which is the story of La Virgen de Guadalupe and Juan Diego. Now, according to tradition, on December 9th, 1531, a native Mexican peasant by the name of Juan Diego encountered a vision of the Virgin Mary on top of hill of Tepeyac near Mexico City. The virgin who spoke to him in his native Nahuatl language, requested that a church be built on that site in her honor. Juan Diego reportedly visited, uh, reported the vision to the Archbishop of Mexico, Sumagarra, but the, but the Archbishop was skeptical and asked for a miraculous sign to prove the authenticity of the vision. On December 12th, the virgin appeared again to Juan Diego and instructed him to gather the flowers from the top of Tepeyac Hill which was barren, especially in the cold of December. Miraculously, Juan Diego found blooming roses there, gathered them in his tilma, a type of cloak, which was made from some uh, agave or it, cactus. I think I think uh, that should have decayed within like a few months, I think. I, I could be within, wrong. Within, within 30 years, it should have completely been decayed. Was it? But we're now going on almost 500 years strong. Yeah, it's about to be nine years since then, or nine years for the 500 mm. years, I think. Now, Juan Diego gathered all these roses and put them in his toma. And when he opened his toma to show the roses, an image of La Virgen was miraculously imprinted on the fabric. This image became known as La Virgen de Guadalupe. The tilma with this image is preserved in the Basilica of Guadalupe in Mexico City, which is one of the most visited Catholic pilgrimage sites in the world. Again, with you know around 20 million people going to this place. Now, La Virgen de Guadalupe has since become a potent symbol of Mexican identity and faith blending indigenous and Christian elements together. During this time... During this time, we have, again, this is la Virgen, This is the image that was imprinted on Juan Diego's tilma. Beautiful image. image. It, it, you know, it's it's beautiful. It has so much symbolic meaning in this that we will cover in the part two of this episode. But you have her standing on top of the moon, goddess. You know, you have her standing on top of the moon. You have her blocking out the sun. This was... These deities in Aztec culture were one of their most prominent. You, you all, when you went to Mexico, what did you visit? Teotihuacan. And what were the pyramids there? A uh, pyramid of El Sol and La Luna. Exactly. You know, the they worshipped these deities, and now you have the mother of Jesus standing on top of their god and blocking out supposedly their most powerful gods. A very interesting note that I will say here. Do you know what, uh, when she appeared to, when she appeared to Juan Diego, there was an instance where Juan Diego wanted to avoid her because his uncle was sick. And she said these beautiful words that I won't repeat here because, again, if, if I wanted to ex explain this story in exact words, which what is to believe the dialogue was, mm -hmm. would, would, would be here for an hour just explaining that story and the dialogue between these things. But... The Virgin Mary said, you know, why are you ignoring me? And Juan Diego said, my uncle is sick. He's dying. And she said, am I not your mother? You know, come to me with your problems and I will help you. Oh, so shit. she told him to continue on your journey to the, to the friar, to the Franciscan. And she appeared to Juan Diego's uncle, healing him. And now she told 
him that her name was Guadalupe. And in Nahuatl language, she told she ex, she told her uncle that her name was Guadalupe. In Nahuatl language, it means she who crushes the head of the serpent. Holy what shit. What is the most... <sighs> What Quetzalcoatl. is Quetzalcoatl is one of the most prominent Mexican, you know, deities that there is out there, and she is the one who crushes the head of the serpent. You have this iconography depicting all of these things that, to us, you know, it looks like La Virgen de Guadalupe. You know, we don't know that much of, you know, Mexican mythology, if you will, Mexican mm -hmm. religion, if you will. But to them, when this image would have appeared to them 500 years ago they would have recognized what the significance of this is instantly. And after this, the next 10 years after this image appeared, she would have converted I think almost it, no? 10 million people within the next 10 years. That's like a thousand, that's like 1,000 conversions a day. This is something that you cannot explain, you know? And the, the other side to this is that, well, no shit, the Spanish are literally conquering the, you know, the native people, the Aztecs and all these native peoples. But give me an example in history where one nation conquers a group of people and they all just accept it. Keep in mind, this happened in 19, in the 1931. This is very fresh to when Cortes completely, you know, when Cortes uh, conquered the Aztec Emperor. This is years later. What, what this do you is mean 19? What do you mean 19? Or sorry, 1531. Yeah, I was like, what? Yeah, so excuse me. This happened in 1531, you know, just a couple years after Cortes conquered the Aztecs. This isn't something that, you know, is later down the line when you can attribute the conquering of a people's, you know, the conversion of a people's to something. This is 10 million people that we're talking about, which is... Uh, another interesting note, during around the same time, you have the Protestant Revolution. Uh, I, that I, I didn't come up with that. There's this person that was saying that it's a revolution, not a reformation, because nothing is reformed during the Protestant Reformation. It truly is a revolution of people just rebelling against the established teachings. And our, I think we lost about, or sorry, the Christians lost about 5 million people that that left the catholic faith or the orthodox faith to protestant to protestantism mm -hmm. and we gained the catholics gained some and then more during this conversion so before i, I kind of want to where where is the moon or what how is she standing on the moon that's i, I can see her obviously blocking the sun but the the moon thing is what I don't really understand. At the bottom of the image, you will find a little angel. And she is standing atop of the crescent moon. She's standing atop of the... It's a crescent moon is what she's standing on top okay. of. Okay. And... Oh. Yes. This, mm, she's standing okay. on top of the crescent moon. Another okay. interesting side note about this moon is that... After these events happened, what does the moon symbolize? What is the moon a symbolic image to? Do you, do you know? It's another religion. Islam. Yeah, I was... Is now, Our Lady stands on the moon. This And this was... This iconography, this image was was displayed during the Battle of Lepanto, which was the Spanish against the Ottoman Empire in a Navy fleet. They had her this? image. Yeah, this image oh, was... They, they had her image during this battle. It was a very decisive... It was a very close battle, but ultimately it was decisive towards the Spanish's win. Again, she's often, she's often referred to as La Victoriosa because her image is displayed in these war... You know, in these war scenarios where... The Christians do, do uh, come come on top and triumph. And and it was this one, La Virgen de Guadalupe. It wasn't the it wasn't the no the Spanish it, one. It, it was this one, okay. La Virgen de Guadalupe in Mexico that her image was displayed, which so, ultimately led you know all the morale, all the guys' morales. It it boosted their morale. 
So what do you think? Why do you think? I don't know. Like, if you now, I'm gonna lean back on 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 kind of like some biasness, but whatever. But why do you think that she would, knowing that she that that having to convert them or or uh, basically, why do you think she allowed that war or wars? to triumph like i don't know how to explain it like since they're since they're always in wars and and you know the christians always triumph mm -hmm. why do you think that's allowed in their you know in their view in god's view or you know you get what i'm trying to say yes i, I do understand and in my years of studying religions I think that is the hardest answer. That's the hardest question to answer. Why does God allow suffering? And is what essentially you are asking, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so why does God allow this? And the simple answer to that, because it's such a complicated question, I don't think anybody truly has a good answer to it. But the simple is that God gives us the freedom to act out our lives in the manner in yeah, which we see fit kind of basically just the free will and you have these instances where life is just too cruel and god has to intervene and we find this in the old testament with noah he intervenes and starts fresh again we had this instance in during you know la reconquista when the the spanish were under muslim occupation and la virgen intervened to help you know to boost the morale of the people and then you have it again in mexico where there is all this warfare but i think we simply can't understand god is yeah, is essentially I think, it uh, you know because how can she appear to them to the uh, you know all these aztecs living their life without the spanish conquering and convert them and truly make an impact you can't the only way you can have such an impact, unfortunately, is through suffering. Through suffering, you find adversary, adversity. And you find through this adversity, you find La Virgen de Guadalupe. That's crazy because I would know, so, I mean, not me personally, but I would know so many people saying that that's just so wrong to say. That in order to for that to happen, you need suffering to to happen, mm -hmm. you know? Well, all all great things come from suffering. Well, 100%. You know, the United States was found on suffering. Every sovereign nation was found on some type of suffering. And that is where we do find our adversity. That is, that is where we find our connection. Now, one of the miracles um, that she made after she appeared and after her image appeared to the bishops and after she was authorized as this Everybody went wild. Every, everybody went crazy. You know, here you have the Aztecs saying, "This is our mother." Mary decided to appear to them in the in a mestica form. She didn't appear to them as a white yeah. lady. You know, had, yeah. the, the Spanish have a, a, a lighter complexions, and she didn't appear to them as brown as the native indigenous people would have looked. She appeared to them as a mixed color. You know, similar to what your skin tone is. <laughs> That, oh, they call her La Morenita. Yeah, La Morenita. Yeah, yeah it's, but it's a mix between what uh, what the outcome is of the indigenous and Spanish. You know, that is essentially what Mexican, you know, Mexicans, yeah. we're, we're a mixed race of, you know, different ethnics. And that's how she chose to appear to them. Another interesting note is that her hair and this black ribbon is, signifies a pregnant native lady from Aztec signifying that she is pregnant at this time. So at this time that this image was revealed, she has baby Jesus in her, which I, uh, this is a completely different note that I want to cover on part two. I think that Christianity has so much instances where it, in a way it tells us the codes of the universe. In a way it tells us the multiverse, you know, this quantum entanglements between time ah. and how irrelevant mm -hmm. time is to our current life, but how it interplays within the fabric of reality. 
because he or she appears to us as, you know, being pregnant. But in our, in our lifetime, you know, that happened 2000 years ago. She was pregnant, you know, around 2000 years ago. Exactly. Now, uh, another interesting wasn't note. it? How do you know exactly how they knew or how it was the message sent that she was pregnant? Didn't they do some radar? Or yeah, uh, apparently or some thermal something. No, um, that scope that you know what doctors were they have around their necks they can hear heartbeats. Oh yeah. Uh, the story goes that somebody put one of those scopes up to the image when they were studying it and they heard a heartbeat or they heard a noise. So they hired a noise specialist and, and he did the same thing. He put up that note to hear what that noise was. And he was like, this is a heartbeat, but it's not one heartbeat. It's two heartbeats. And signifying that she truly is pregnant, uh, she truly is pregnant. Um, according to that noise. Now, how we know is because of the image. The way her mm -hmm. hair is parted mm -hmm. and that black ribbon, that black ribbon that she's wearing right here, that is what pregnant Aztec ladies would would wear to signify that they are pregnant. Hmm. Now that uh, how, how how about the, how about that little kid down there? That story that's an angel. Okay, but that story about that those heartbeats, um, that plays in part with the image being alive. People have said that. The image is alive and how we know that is because it maintains 98 degrees this image maintains a temperature of 98 degrees which is our yeah which is our what, body temperature our body temperature yeah. i do want to point out that that is currently a myth that has been stated in the past before but there has been no new studies to to cement this uh to cement this statement in fact for sure, but in faith, it's still alive, technically. Like oh, in that, faith, 100%. Like, that, like the energy that you feel when you go there. And I'm, <clears throat> if you're Mexican and you can have the opportunity to go there, and even if you're not religious, I don't know, man. Maybe it's just my biasness or whatever that I grew up with her, but I felt energy and it was. Although I did feel more of the energy in La Basilica, I didn't feel it more like when I was. Going up the mountain and Tepeyac and stuff, you know. That's uh, I think that's obvious in a way because that's where her, yeah. her image is. <laughs> oh, for sure. But yeah. I was just, I was just <laughs> stating that out. Which, when you go visit it, the basilica that she's in right now is actually not the original one. It's the one next to it, the one that's like it's sinking. sinking. Yeah. It's sinking. Mm -hmm. So, a uh, another interesting note about the symbology of this image, like I, like I said, it, it correlates ethnic groups like la virgen de guadalupe in spain did it correlated the ethnic groups between you know muslim and spanish here we have the same thing with the spanish and aztec and the mexica the native people another thing that i find very interesting is at the very bottom where the angel is at what colors are those the mexican colors ain't it no it's red white and blue might not see from mother, but it's red, white, and oh. blue. That's supposed to be white, but obviously over the time, the tilma has changed colors, and the image has altered a little bit. But it's red, white, and blue. I think it signifies a prophecy. Whether that was the prophecy of Our Lady of Champion in Wisconsin, that saying that she was going to appear in the United next. States next, or whether it signifies a new evangelism uh, uh. that's still in the future. That's still going to be in our future. But I feel that there is some sort of interplay that she is going to take a part, you know, within the state, within the country of, you know, the red, white, and blue. And that's hmm. that, That's just, just the some symbology to, and okay. a theory. But I do find it very interesting. Now. Yeah, that, that is. Uh, us that we keep bringing that Wisconsin thing. Do you know about that? Um This church, or they have La Virgen de Guadalupe somewhere in like Chicago, and a lot of people go visit it and even go stop by. I, I've been there like two times, and I don't, I've never paid attention to it because it was like when I was in, you know, I never. 
but pe- but it's like a little shrine kind of thing, and mm. I don't know. I'm, I swear it's in Chicago, it's, but it's apparently just, she appeared. I don't know if she appeared. That I was just asking. Maybe mm. it's just like a statue, and then you go visit it, and then that's like visiting mm. like something else. Maybe it's just something like that. No, I I but don't. I don't know if you knew that. I've been. I was trying to look it up, but I don't want to. No, really spend my time on that. No, I, I I don't know about that particular story. However, like I said, Marin apparitions. Science can't explain Marin apparitions. There is. Ten, there's dozens of them. There's over 20 Marian apparitions. I think that the Catholic Church has only authent- authenticated, I don't know, 12, less than 20. But they pop up all over the world. This is just something, this is something like, okay, can science explain something? Can science explain why 10 million people converted within 10 years? You know, whether this image is true, whether this tradition is just oral, whether there's there's no evidence to directly correlate to it. You know, although I would argue that this image is evidence, um, whether it's true or not, you know, you have eyewitnesses. It's the same thing with the Bible. You know, it, not only does it have the historical truths, but... The reason why, you know, Christianity is a thing is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Dude, how much fucking people witnessed that? Over 500? Mm-hmm. And they were all persecuted to their death mm-hmm. because of what they, they believed to be yeah, truth. Because they didn't accept that. They didn't lie. Yeah. So you have these mirror apparitions that people, you know, I'm sure would bet their lives on that they experienced. Oh. But as far as, as far as that, as far as that story uh, or that, in Chicago, I'm I'm actually not very I'm not aware of that. If yeah, I'm being honest, I try to pop it up here or try to look it up, but now nah, I'll see where it is. Now the miracles of La Virgen de Guadalupe. Um, are you gonna talk about a little bit more of her of how she appeared in her her stuff, like her depictions, like with remember her eyes too? Yeah, yeah, I am. That's where okay, that's where okay. I was going at. Perfect. So the mir- the miracles of our Virgen de Guadalupe. The miracles are countless, and I think you can categorize them into a few different ways. One, tradition. What does tradition say? What does the oral story say? Keep in mind that these events happened years, you know, very close to the conquering of the Mexica people. And what you find is that these are oral stories, you know? The Aztecs didn't really have a written form where they documented their events. It was all orally passed down. You have some pictograms, you know, the Mexican hieroglyphs, if you will, or the Aztec hieroglyphs, if you will, that depict stories. But at the time, it was all orally, which over the entire context or span of human civilizations, the oral teaching has been the most accurate in recording history you know, throughout all, eth- throughout all ethnic groups of the entire world. That's how we know what we know today is because of oral tradition. For the most part. For the most part, correct. So this was, um, fuck, where was I going at? Oh, so, cor- so according to tradition uh, and all these miracles, you can classify them as tradition or things that truly did happen, things that we can record now, which now we have the image to record. Now we have the Mexican population. They're all heavily Catholic. They're all, um, they all heavily worship La Virgen de Guadalupe still, still. So one of those historical traditions, miracle, those, those miracles, based on that tradition is you know the flowers why the fuck is there flowers in In december December? you have you have according to tradition once everybody was celebrating once they seen her image they were shooting arrows all over the place and a native got shot in the head or in the neck and died she brought him back to life another miracle another person being saved from near from from death you know not just juan diego's uncle and you also have, let me pull this up here. I have all these notes. You have the apparition itself. You have 
the image of Our Lady on the tilma. Now, I will make a quick note. Is the tilma itself a miracle? And I would find that if you take care of something, I think that it's going to last a very long time. And that's where the other side of the argument comes. You know, hmm. we have something that we're taking very good care of. Obviously, it's going to last a very long time. Now, the tilma is not necessarily just made out of a cactus fiber that decays in 30 years. It's actually made of a more robust fabric that I, you know, I, I had it down. I can't find it on my notes, but it's made out of a more robust fabric. Let, but that's that's beside the point. You know, it it's still going on almost 500 years strong. And this image also survived a bombing. Have you ever heard of that story? Mm-mm. Yeah, not at all. There was a there was a bombing actually. Oh, it's led... a, I, maybe not the bombing, but I think it survived the earthquake too. Yeah, it did. But this this survived the uh, a bombing by the Freemasons. Actually, the Freemasons at the time there were Freemasons in Mexico. You know, an anti Christian organization, uh, and they bombed the image miraculously. Somebody protected the image which was her son, God, protected the image. I'll pop it up right here. Um, and so the image sur survived. And it, at the time, it was only enclosed in, in glass. I don't, I don't have a pull-up yet. It, no, I know. Uh, it seems like it's still just in glass. I, I don't know how they take care of it, but, you know, you go up there and you stare at it and, cause that's, and it just looks like glass too. <laughs> Obviously, it's probably not, but yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure it's probably it's like probably some bulletproof <laughs> stuff now. Has to be, because then you got people fucking probably gonna throw paint at it <laughs> and sit there. And <laughs> no, hold up. If I can pop up a picture here, man, all these pictures are small as fuck. You know what? Fuck, let's just pop it over here. No, hold up. Yeah, so this story, um, like I said, the Freemasons were currently on an anti-Christian mission at the time. And they set off a bomb at... Uh, in the presence of the Toma image. And miraculously, God of the Father, God of the Son, protected her mother. Man, is this really the only image that I can get? But this was the cross. This was a, 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 this was like a, I don't know what you call these, the cross that was there, and it absorbed the entire blast cross. radius. Yeah. This, so this, this is like one of those things. You know, when you go to church, they have these, these, literally this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might explain it. Literally this. Okay. They, they have these here, just just till the next. You know, as iconography. Okay. okay. And this absorbed the blast radius. Now there was people in this church. Nobody died. The image, huh. the image was there. The image was fully intact, and ultimately because God absorbed the image, God protected His mother, and it absorbed the image. And this is literally proof that it happened. First of all, there's historical proof that the bombing happened, and this is proof that it absorbed the blast. It's a miracle that science cannot explain. Well. Not only that, but it's also a miracle that, well, it's not a miracle, but when stuff like this happens and it like raises more the belief of people that are like, oh shit, this saved my life. A hundred percent, I'm going to do pilgrimage. A hundred percent, I'm going to do this because that's what pilgrimages are usually are. I've, I was looking at, um, different types of relics mm -hmm. of different types of religions and people do pilgrimage for i don't know you know just you know if this was the cup of christ they do pilgrimage for that mm -hmm. and just because of you pray so much of something and then something good happens and same thing like this you know yeah. it raises more of the, the belief of it yeah now another crazy miracle is her eyes what you're what you're inquiring about so the story goes that if you magnify her eyes which you know looking at it from the tilma it's 
uh, you, you know, you can barely see yeah. her eyes from the tumor. Yeah. Now, if you magnify them, I think the number was like magnify them like 2000% or something along those mm -hmm. lines. You see an image of the, of what she, of the present of, you know, of what she was looking at. What, when Our Lady appeared, you see the image of what she was looking at. And this is the image that you find. You have, if I'm not mistaken, you have like 13 different people. You have Juan Diego in her eyes. You have all these people in her eyes. And so, that's what you get when so you there magnify was, it. So technically there was more people at that apparition yes, well, than when Juan Diego. This, this would be when Juan Diego would open up his toma okay. and, the mirror, and the image appeared. I believe that is what was imprinted in her eyes. You have mm -hmm. the archbishops, you have, you know, all these other Franciscans, all these friars there too. Yeah. You have Juan Diego. Now, now, like, is this yeah, really a thing? I, you know, I was like, because I could, I could make that something out of nothing. Because you have these pixels, you know, when you look at it, it's so pixelated. And this is, you know, what it would be in a black and white pixelated form, you know. I I want to say that it's a stretch trying to get these images right there and that image they're colored yeah. in. That does look like a person to me right there though. I can't man, I can't see it. I don't Th this person right here does. Look, if you look, there's the head, his eyes, his mouth, his hair, his body, his collar. Right <laughs> see here. but see but now we're getting to like is it really that or are you just thinking that because it looks like that. There's a lot of things that look like something, you know? I would agree. I definitely would agree. But there is also... I'm not trying to make a case for no, it. No, 100%. I, I'm definitely not. I'm just bringing it up for Ooh. the argument, for to challenge, you know, just to talk about it, to yeah. bring awareness. Well, I'm, the, I'm, I'm bringing it up as a... I want to look at it as a different type of, you know, as a... It's not skeptic, but just... But these, these pixel renditions have been digitized you know to get computer renditions and you also have this image as well now this was brought into uh, a computer software to to kind of just block out all of the noise mm -hmm. and to focus on the people in her eyes does that change your mind at all you just your your perspective your perspective uh, i don't i mean it doesn't change. I mean, I see maybe a guy kneeling. So they're kneeling, yeah. you know, I see that as well, but uh, I'm not, I'm not trying to be that guy. I don't want to really be that guy, <laughs> but you know, which this is one of the most, you know, brought up things. you know, when you zoom up into your eyes, you know, you get this image and, you know, I think this is mm, probably a stretch. Yeah, I think so too. I'm not. Like I said, maybe it is, but I, I can't just go off of pixels. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but other than that, now <clears throat> more more miracles though is that you find that the painting on the Toma. First of all, it's unreplicatable. People cannot replicate it when they try to paint her on the same fabric style of the t of what the tomo is they simply can't the second thing is that when you had people study it they it was like the pigment floats above the fabric as well not only that but it was as if the image was just one almost stroke. printed yeah mm -hmm. in, in one stroke which is curious because that 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 term is used, it's painted like in one stroke, but the image isn't painted. Mm -hmm. It's embedded. It's etched. It's etched. I don't know. It's weird. But another note is that this image has currently, has been touched up though. So when you find that the majority of the image hasn't been altered or painted, nothing like that, it is important to note that this image has been touched up. And a lot of the times skeptics bring that up, and that it has been okay. painted, it has been touched up. Something along that they it had a crown before, which I found that uh, before in 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 history, um, they they um, they put a crown on her before, like a symbolic, like she is our queen symbolically, yeah, and they yeah. painted it before, and then they removed it, or then it faded out throughout time, but it has been touched up since then. 
There was also an instance, another miracle, where they were studying it and they don't know what the pigment is. The pigment, it's not from this world, like if this image is was created in heaven. As well, when they were studying it, they dropped acid on it. And when the acid was eating the fabric away, according to eyewitnesses, the fabric was healing itself and it mended itself back after the acid took place. Hmm. Now, one thing that I will know, I tried to look, I tried to search for these, you know, if, if this image is being studied, I tried to look for these documents and I personally could not find them. You know, you can find names of people that studied it. You can find this, but you can't find, you know, a, a paper that, shows somebody's description of you know what they did to the study what they use and all this stuff um another thing that i find interesting is that when you try to take like let's say if you want to make a documentary about this there was a catholic there's a popular catholic um just guy on youtube that wanted to make a documentary about it and the basilica or the government of Mexico, somebody with authority didn't per allow him to go in there with the professional cameras to, to record the image and stuff like this. So that is where my skepticism comes in. You know, who is doing these research? Who is studying exactly, it? Exactly. Um, on another note, apparently there is something called uh, Guadalupe researchers that literally devote their entire lives to just Guadalupe to just this image, to study it and all these things. Um, but again, I can't, unless my uh, researching skills for this episode was trash, I could not find something that would describe, you know, a scientifically researched okay. the image or something along those well, lines. That's what I was going to come at. I'm like, all right, who's the one doing these researches and who's the ones approving them and how do they mm -hmm. do that and... What do they use? And, you know, I feel like I, I've, 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 I've also heard that the Vatican goes and does their own research and brings their own guys. And then they just kind of can play with that little the data or whatnot, you know? Uh, yeah. And another interesting note is that the, the historical truths about Juan Diego you can't you, you you don't know if he really existed or not is also the other thing there is no documents that can that say that juan diego really did see this image another thing is that the friar sumagarra we have documentation about this friar and we have his we have his letters some of his letters and stuff like that we even have some of his letters after this apparition occurred and he never once mentions the version of Guadalupe. Hmm. You would think that something this powerful, this friar would 100%. completely devote his entire life to, again, researching it or spreading the word. And we find that Sumagarra uh, doesn't really write about this. And we find that there is no historical documents that, that we can attest the authenticity of Juan Diego as a being. But again... We have the Tilma. We have what we know. We have all these things. We have 10 million conversions. So here's where the skeptical mind comes into play, though. You know, which uh, is it true? Is it false? Curious. Uh, let's go to the restroom and then let's get into this. I need to go to the bathroom. Okay. Real quick. Yeah, you know, uh, you know what this, there's just so much story. There's so much complications with the story, but there's also so much truths as well. And, you know, is it true? Is it false? I think ultimately that's that's up to the individual, you know? You know, I don't... I try to be on the skepticism side of a lot of things. And it's just more because, you know... Because... I've looked at things where I believe, like, I believe this or I believe that. And, and, um, and then you just, you don't ever look at it two ways. You get me like right mm -hmm. now, like right now, honestly, I, I, I believe, 
I believe this in this operation. Um, just f honestly, just because of my own personal experience, one, like, why did I knee when I was young? Why did I kneel from the beginning to whatever? Why? Like, yeah. literally, why? You walked kneeling, right? Kneeling yeah, I, to, yeah. I, I kneeled. And that's a you lot of crawled, people. Uh, crawled, uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of people do that in because probably my, people might ask a question, why did I do that? And a lot of people actually do that to um, like a pilgrimage. like yeah. And I don't know why I did that. So it's like, huh. And then when I go there, I do feel some type of energy that I can't be explained that I, it's just like an emotional wrecking in your like body. Like you're just like, you kind of almost want to tear up and you're just like, you, you know, you got to not in your throat, not in my throat. And then, and then more than anything, I don't know. I, I, it's, I, I do believe in it, but there is some kind of like some doors that need to be kind of open down who's, who mm -hmm. did this research, who looked this up, and, like, I don't know, the I thing, I I used to kind of believe in that, but that's more on the, I don't know, I don't mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, it's not convincing, so, I don't know, and then also, could the Spanish, I'm not saying made it up, but could have, could they have had some influence on trying to get the Aztecs to Christianity? You know, that's also a, a way of form you have to look at this. Now, I'm not saying that. Yeah, that. This, but, like, you know, it's just like, obviously, I understand all cultures and religions has always has, has always believed in something. There has never been one that, oh, I'm atheist. I'm sorry. There has never been. Mm -hmm. Whether you believe in this God or that God or these gods or that God, it's always been about, you know, believe in something. And yeah. with the Aztecs and the serpent and all that stuff. I don't know. I could could have could have been, you know, what what, what what where I where I'm leaning on not understanding this is the Spain and the Mexico one and what there is some intertwinement in. Not only that, but oh, what was I going to say? Um but why didn't they, what was it, the archbishop write anything about it? Mm -hmm. You feel me? Yeah, it's definitely crazy. First of all, what you were saying earlier, you know, unfortunately, the corruption of man always interferes with everything. So, you know, just like, just like anything, you know, could people be using religion to, you know, convert the people to control them? You know, ultimately, I feel like that's one of the most basic arguments. You know, people use religion to control you and things like that. Yeah, um, people that don't have anything to which, fall on, like I've said before. Which, but in a way, it does carry some truth because even now, people use Hollywood, people use music to control people, you know, with like to push certain agendas and movies and things like that. That's a exactly. real, that's a real thing. 100%. So, you know, do people do that? You know, of, of course, but back to the thing that you said, humans have been worshiping most likely as long as they haven't been, ex have they been existing? We, since the time of recorded history with the Sumerians, people have been worshiping something, some pantheon, some spirits, some shamanism, some, you know, more inclined towards energy. And if you look at, if you look even past that, you know, to 130,000 years ago with the Homo naledi species that they buried their dead with beads, <laughs> showing signs of a belief of an afterlife, therefore correlating it with a belief of a higher creation or something along those lines. A completely different, uh, completely different, you know, uh, species have done that. If I'm not mistaken, the oldest, the oldest, religious site if you will worshiping site that humans have if i'm not mistaken is about seventy thousand years ago and they were offering like spearheads to a serpent to a serpent or something along those lines so again back to that people have been worshiping for their you know since the spawn of creation now you know you know that worshiping thing people use that against against religion because oh what 
well, we have a com we had a comment on uh, one of our reels. It was like, oh yeah, because your God is the true God, you know, compared to the other three in 2099 yeah, uh-huh, gods there is, uh-huh. which is humorous because, you know, that, that is an argument, but there's something that is often missed out on, which is that the historical truth revolving certain events just triumph over others. I, this I was going to say, it, and what has lasted. And that is the simple fact, you know, you know, which, we have had... 2000 years of historical truth since Jesus before that we had the old testament of prophecies fulfilled prophecies that that said that a messiah was going to come and the messiah came after those that was two, 2000 years ago was Jesus before that how long was that you know how how long before that before Jesus the some of the messiah came were people worshiping you know golden you know, calves <laughs> <laughs> and, and things along those lines, you know, there's things, sometimes things do appear and there is just no explanation for it. And because there is no explanation for it does not mean that it did not happen or does not mean that we just can't prove otherwise. Because I do agree to the statement that you said earlier, science does come so far and then comes God because that appears to be the case. And we just, just look, just look at a black hole why are people so interested in a black hole because to our understanding now the science that we know to be true breaks down in the singularity it it just completely breaks down and then you have things like string theory again it string theory only works in more than our dimension you know in more than our three or four dimensions of space String theory works when you start involving more dimensions of space. And then gravity, as we said in our exoplanets and black holes, gravity is one of the weakest forces of nature because it's believed to spill into other dimensions. It grabs more than our dimension and things along those lines. So, and it's not science goes so far and then more science explains that science or more advanced science explains that because it's just a continuing, you know? Yeah. It's just a misunderstanding, a misunderstanding. And, and nothing, and something does not come from nothing. That is a fundamental fact. Something does not come from nothing. The Big Bang did not come from a bunch of nothingness. To, so. And, and back to the, the popular show right now going on the three body problem. Once you understand that the three body problem, why is it so big and why, uh, I think Isaac Newton, I think, uh, was the, uh, they don't understand, they, we can, you know, we can figure out what a two body system does, but then once that three one, it messes everything up mm-hmm. and then it goes all crazy. But I, I do think us as humans, we are very arrogant to try to understand everything and I get it, but. I think it leads you nowhere. I just think it, it leads you nowhere. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's because you don't stand or believe in something, you know. Which comes to, you know, why we live. We have to find that purpose. Ultimately, it's that purpose that drives <clears throat> us, you know. Whether that purpose is to obtain things or whether that purpose is to live experiences. Or, you know, we have to find that purpose and ultimately... You know, that's what makes or breaks that ego of a mind, you know, that humans being too ego to, I don't know, to open themselves up to a different kind of purpose or a different kind of meaning. But who knows, you know, skeptics and atheists, their purpose is to um, push their agenda or to their purposes to question that stuff. It's just, it's just them. It's, it's an ideology. They're in tune and attached with their idea, you know, ideology and, I mean, I don't know. I, I truly do hope they find peace sometime and someday, but they, they always, I always seem to, I don't know. They're just like nomads. They're just yeah, like you wandering don't, yeah. without anything. Um, that, what we just said is a interesting point about, you know, is it real or not? But also why... Why do a lot of Catholics not really know 
about La Virgen de Guadalupe since it's that big. It's probably the biggest, you know, mm-hmm. apparition, you know, Marian apparition out there. So, like, I know a lot of, um, I told you the, the story. We were working in a quarry and the guy asked me, which I don't have it because it was giving me some rashes. But uh, I had that San Benito mm-hmm. little thing. He said, hey, what is that? And then we just sat there talking, whatever. And I told him that I went to Mexico and to and I did pilgrimage to Virgen de Guadalupe. He said, hey, what is it? So what is that? And then I just told him the little whole story of Juan Diego and what, and he didn't even know about it. So why do a lot of Catholics not really know about it? Which is still, it's still like, what? This is probably the, mm-hmm. you, yeah, you can go it, and probably, you know, Mexico City and go see it yourself. Yeah, if you're, you know, you can. And it's fairly inexpensive as well. Super inexpensive. Um, It goes back to ignorance and not being educated which is why I left the church. I left religion because it didn't have any answers for me. And a quick note about that, ultimately, ultimately, now that I left it and I do my own research and I investigate all these, these things, it, in a way, it kind of leads me back to that. But it, it, it's that. And I think the reason why uh, Christianity is weak is because of the father figure in the religion which is the priest, which is your, the people who educate you, the churches and things like that. Because I'll, I'll tell you this, you know, once, once Monsignor left, oh, 100%. Uh, yeah, once our Monsignor left, you know, there was no good priest that was, that, that would, can fulfill that spot, that would fulfill that spot. And they were all boring. They were, they all were uneducational. They were all reading from a script and year after year, we would hear the same things. And that is why people, that's why Catholics don't know. And when I refer to Catholics, I refer to the Catholics in my space, you know, the ones that were around me, the those that I seen that were not, that did not do their, those that just went to Sunday Mass and believed that they fulfilled their duty, which is... For the week, which and then is, go sin on Monday. Yeah, which, you know, is the same thing. It's just, a, you know... Faith is supposed to be hard. You have to find your faith. You know, it's not just about going to mass. But ultimately, uh, it's because the father figure in the churches don't teach it. They don't, they just read from a book and they give a small example and that's it. And that's it. That's why Catholics don't know about it because they're not taught about it. They don't do their own research. They don't do, you know, any things. And that's particularly why I think I, I obviously have took a break from the religion side but i haven't took a break from the the faith side i mm-hmm. have that strong faith i just don't do what i should do which is go to church and go to mass and confirmation or confession and all that mm-hmm. stuff um but it also comes back to what you were saying like the the people that are put in that position to give you the word of god is it lacks it lacks mm-hmm. and what have i been telling you lately I've been finding all of what I find um, um, fundamentally what is the word of God online and through YouTube videos, Marmari and mm-hmm. and and Cliff. Well, I don't know his last name, but Cliff. They they just talk in ways that it's like oh, oh whoa, yeah. and it brings you back to your faith and mm-hmm. and also reading the Bible myself instead of. Yeah, you know, I still, in my eyes, and it's like I said, it's very arrogant. I think I still find Sunday Mass to be some sort of chore, and I don't like, I don't want it to be that. You feel me? And that's mm-hmm. why it's just so hypocritical for me to do things just to be, just to do them, to do them. I remember me and my mom we went to the Mass in 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 Mexico City, and to go, col, you know, colmulgar yeah. and take. La hostia, and which is what take the bloody and body of Christ. Yes. And I just was like, for what? Like, I haven't done nothing. I don't go to church. I haven't done what Jesus tells me. Like, why would I do that? I, there's importance in that. And I was like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I'm like, no, it's not okay. Mm-hmm. It's not okay because I, I'll be a hypocrite. I'm, I, I, I'm lying to myself. And, you know, yeah, you, you're just, not, you're it, not fit to I'm not, receive the I'm blood not fit to, re- to receive it. Why would I receive it? Just because it's just because I'm a Catholic? No. And that's where I, that's where I challenge, and I'm not judging. I challenge our 
are Catholicism because I know so much people that are like that. I know that some so much people, the way they talk, and that's the way they talk, the way they are, the way they judge, um, and then they go to Sunday mass and you know, and they and, take and the, then, and then they they do everything and oh. It, that's why that's why in Catholicism it's very known that the most judgy people are the ones that go to church. Oh yeah, you know. Well, that's in Christianity in that, general, a hundred percent. But like, that's why I need to become a better person to fulfill, to fulfill, you know, Jesus' mm -hmm. word and to actually be a better person and not judge whether whatever with whatever you oh you know with whatever you're wearing or whatever you do like, you know, mm -hmm. and be truly at peace. And yeah, yeah, and the and the thing about that feeling like a chore, the thing is that according to scripture, you do need to go to mass and you do need to be a part of a body of you know the people that worship it. So, and I you know, know. I, I think I would uh, I mentioned it the other day about uh, you know uh, confessing and things like that. You know, you just go in and a priest, all right, you're absolved of your sins. Uh, go give me. 10 homers and these things like that. I think ultimately it is truly finding somebody that truly does educate you, finding a church that mm -hmm. is the right fit for you because that's something that people don't do, you know? You know, we used to go to the visitation and then we went to St. Anthony's for a little bit and then we found a home with Christ the King because of our, our Monsignor there. And that's where we found it and unfortunately now the the father heads and these churches if they don't fulfill you then you have to do your task and to either raise your voice and to be like you know what the fuck's going on here you know you know you should do better and i think that that lacks in that la at least when i was a part of it and and i still go to mass sometimes too um to the same churches that I would always go to, and it still lacks. There is no progression, and there won't be any progress in Catholicism until there is a change for the better, until the, our father figures start to implement, you know, the Word of God, not just reading from their Sunday literature. Yeah, but it's... It the blindness of people with their religion that won't do or say anything because they're like, oh, well, you know what? Well, this is what the church put, so I'm not going to say anything and, and just, yeah, just not, go to church. And that's yeah. it. That's what it, I, th I think ultimately it is. Yeah. But, you know, that that all leads back to a week, a week following, you know, and that's, a, it's been the conversation that Christians are weak. Christians are they don't defend themselves. They don't do this and they don't do that because again, you know, what is, what, where is the strength in the family structure? It all comes from the father. It all comes from the head figure, you know, and that translates from the church to a household, to um, a military platoon, to work. You, you all, you need, a father figure in everything. There is a father figure in it. There's a leader in everything. And there is weak leadership in the church today. Well, not only that, but I, like we've been, we just had this conversation the other day about our Pope or the Pope uh, Francis and he lacks in something in some ways and he's progressive in others. But I think ultimately it, it makes the church weak in my personal opinion. Because mm -hmm. he in technically in the way he doesn't stand for anything, if especially with the, uh, which I have no issue with LGBTQ people. Like the church is the church, and the LGBTQ thing is some other thing, and integrating that. I don't. I don't know. I just I find it very weak. I find it very weak. Which ultimately, I guess that's progressive in his eyes. But yeah. So that and that also is another complicated discussion. You know, mm -hmm. where I'm like, if he allows that, what else is allowed? The the thing with that barrier is that, you know, meeting in the middle ground. But the thing is with, you know, this progressive mindset, you meet in the middle and then 
there's something else's bra. So you meet in the middle again. And every single time you meet in the middle. Yeah, Jordan Peterson talks about being, it. You're, yeah, you're being. Jordan Peterson talks about it. They take a little bit, but then mm-hmm. you give a little, take a little, but then ultimately you're going way, which, way, way. Which in matters of the faith, you cannot give an no. inch. We have the scriptures. We have the teachings. We have the life of Jesus Christ. We have all of these things. It's cemented in place. There is no room to give. There is no inch to give. There's no centimeter to give. We have what the teachings are. And when you get what a lot of people think weak leadership is with the current Pope, you have a complete, you know, when you have weak leadership like that, you have the Protestant Reformation. When you have weak leadership like that, you have the Great Schism where the Orthodox branched off from Catholicism. When you have weak leadership, you have who knows how many fucking denominations of oh we're christians oh we're christians yeah, well we yeah, believe in it. like yeah. you know it's it's all it's all and rubbish then they become into cults yeah too. and then you have uh the jehovah witness which is uh, a cult yeah so um and just to and just one more thing i wanted us to, to bring up about about the virgen de guadalupe because now we kind of got a little sidetrack which is good but um I've been looking at uh I've been looking at a few peop not a few videos, but I've been looking at a few things about, you know, different apparitions and whatnot. And this one comment really came to to yeah, maybe we leave it at the at that, but it, it kind of stuck in my head. And he brought up this uh two Corinth Corinthians eleven fourteen verse uh from Paul. And um, I'll say right here, you know, he Paul wrote that Satan sometimes masquerades as an angel of light in order to try to deceive us. So. With that being said, is this could this could all these operations be that? Uh, What would you my response to that? Yeah, you find that Satan does masquerade himself in sometimes in light to deceive the following of Jesus or of God. But remember that there is specific parameters into what a Marian apparition is considered to be viable or false. I'll tell you what, Satan would not appear as La Virgen de Guadalupe for the reason that she is, that she is the one that crushes the head of the serpent. Satan is the serpent and she crushes the head. She appeared as the conqueror of their god of the sun and their god of the moon. She appeared as the evangelizer of the new world, of the new world of the Americas. She evangelized 10 million people within, uh, you know, 9 million people within 10 years and continues to do so. She appeared as so much good here in the new world and in the old world with the Spanish and the Muslim conquest. I feel that Although Satan does have different forms and things like this, I feel that he is he would be nothing compared to the mother of Christ. And I'm not comparing her at all. I'm just saying, you know, yeah. what I, he, he noted that, and I was just like, I feel like that was very ignorant to say. Um, but also, how about those other, like in Catholic and Catholicism, there's a lot of saints, too, like. Uh, especially in the Mexican culture, San Judas and yeah, uh, my my answer is, is the that same. The same thing, or my, no? My my answer is the same. You know what is a saint? Essentially, a saint is uh, a, obviously a flawed person. Nobody lives a perfect life besides Jesus and his mother. That's why, you know, um, the Virgin Mary is who she is because God would not send His Son to be born from a corrupted soul. The Catholics and Orthodox believe that the Virgin Mary was also sinless because just like in the Old Testament, when you build such a beautiful structure like the Ark of the Covenant to house the presence of God, God will not come in a corrupted soul. The Virgin Mary was perfect, lived that perfect life Mm -hmm. like Jesus. And that's where you get these saints. You know, saints are corrupted people. They're, They're like me and you, but they find themselves in what? You know, Billy Carson, 
I, I first heard it from him. He calls it he calls it Christ consciousness, and I really like that term well, because why did God send His Son to become like God to live? He 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 showed that you can live that perfect life, that you can to follow Him, to become like Him, to achieve that Christ consciousness, and that is what saints do. They achieve that Christ consciousness, and eventually are sanctified. To be to be shown as examples, to be an example for the rest of us to follow. Now, I'll follow up with that with that. I kind of do feel that saints are rubbish because people start praying for them, and I feel that you know, if you read the Catholic Bible in particular, you know it's in the Bible, but if you read other Bibles, it's not in the Bible. You know, worshiping saints and things like that, or praying to saints. I think it's you know, you go straight to the source, which is God. Yeah, which the Christ, you know, the Christian Christ consciousness or whatever. That's actually that was actually a cult. Yeah, there's actually a cult. I don't know if Billy Carson got that from that. Really? Did I not? Billy, I did not know that, think, but I do like I think that Billy's term. Is rubbish, but and uh, I can't remember what we were gonna say. What I was gonna say after that. We were talking about something, but yeah, no, yeah. Well, 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 listen. Let let me wrap this up with. Let me wrap this up with the connection. And like I said, let me wrap this up with one, the connection, and also that this is just a part one. A part two will come out in and we'll go more in depth um, to Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico. You know, I just wanted a broad story okay. that would get us acquainted with the entire story that people don't know. And also, it's in a way impossible to tell the entire story because there's so much apparitions that are all connected and so much apparitions that aren't connected that haven't been authentic authenticized authenticized if that's a word by the church so you know you have the connection that starts in spain with the first apparition that continues in spain with the um the oppression of the muslim that continues in spain with la reconquista and la victoriosa you know the virgin of Guadalupe in Spain, and it follows into the New World, into Mexico, and it prophesizes whether Our Lady of Champions here in the America or some f event in the future. You know, there is a connection that is undeniable and inexplicable. And I'll just leave it with that. Whether it's true or false, maybe we will uncover that in the next episode and the Guadalupe complex part two but for now that is all we got perfect well this is more than I thought I thought it was just gonna be La Virgen de Guadalupe but yeah, I mean there's operations everywhere <laughs> yeah it's a complex for a reason all right guys cool. episode 017 the Guadalupe complex on to the next thank you guys thank you guys